I will never forget that my late husband, he stood on the stage in front of everybody to share his gratitude. And he declared his cancer diagnosis a gift in front of everybody because of what it had done to bring people together. And Giving Kitchen was born from there. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Burnt Chef Journal, a hospitality specific podcast dedicated to challenging mental health stigma and conversations designed to inspire a new, healthier, happier, and more sustainable hospitality profession. The Burnt Chef Journal is proudly sponsored by Plan Day, the workforce management system that helps your business give a shift. From scheduling rotors ahead to tracking time and attendance, managing your team's careers to managing your budgets, Plan Day has everything you need to make your day work in one easy to use platform. Try it yourself with a 30 day free trial only at planday.com. Get your shift together with Plan Day. Ladies and gentlemen, I am joined this week by, I'm going to, now I apologize in advance, Jen. So, hey, is it Jen? Heidinger, Heidinger, like hi, Heidinger, Heidinger Kendrick. Hi, Heidinger <laughs> Kendrick, who is the founder of an incredible organization over in the States called Giving Kitchen. Jen focuses on brand awareness and community involvement, whilst also providing a personal account and telling the story of Giving Kitchen to audiences near and far. Giving Kitchen is an organization that we've sort of been aware of or had conversations with over the past. So I'm really excited to learn more about sort of yourself, Jen, and also Giving Kitchen. So welcome mm. to the podcast. It's good Thank to have you. you here. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for making the time. You're over, whereabouts are you based? Atlanta, Georgia. So Atlanta. East Coast. Mm-hmm. East Coast. Due to travel to Atlanta in end of February for, oh, really? uh, for NAFM. Okay, great. You need to come over. We've got a pretty solid food town over here. So there's lots of good dining and beverage and happy to show you around. Yeah, I would love to have a look around. Thank you. I've never been to the States. That's the one of the only countries I've States in Australia at the moment. So I'm uh-huh. looking forward to it. So Jen, talk to us. Talk to us, Jen. What's your story? What's your background? Because you originally yeah. founded a restaurant chain as well, right? I did. Not a chain, but an independent here in Atlanta. My goodness, where do we begin? Well, I was born. No, I won't go that far back. But, you know, I will say this. Giving Kitchen is an incredible nonprofit. And what we do is help food service workers in crisis. And it's that origin story of why I feel so inspired, motivated, and honored and privileged, really, to continue to share it. I've been sharing it for 11 years plus And it genuinely doesn't get old. It only gets more inspired. And that's the truth. So, you know, my late husband was a chef, Ryan Heidinger. He and I are both originally from Indianapolis, Indiana. So the Midwestern part of the country. And we moved here to Atlanta in 2004. He actually had gone to culinary school in the city back in 1997, 98 timeframe. And at that point, interestingly enough, he said that Atlanta, Georgia was too big. It, it chewed him up and spit him out is what, like one of those phrases that we use here. And so when he moved back to Indianapolis, we met in 2000, we coupled, I went to college four years, da, da, da. And then we ended up, long story short, landed back here in 2004 as a great opportunity to get outside of a smaller food town into a bigger food town where just the energy and the food culture was really booming at that time. He, as a chef, that was his full-time, you know, thing. A story that I tell actually pretty frequently is, especially I think it's totally fitting for what we're talking about today, you know, as a younger person for Ryan, food and cooking started off as a form of caregiving for his older brother and younger sister when they would come home from school and he would pull just, you know, label lists, these nameless kind of tin cans out of the cupboard, and he would prepare meals for them. And that was what he just loved. And then he grew up in that form and in that culture of food and just really learned from some really amazing top name chefs in our area. And that's really kind of how he honed in his personal skill. For myself, and I feel like many others, especially in the United States, you know, Most Americans, 50% have worked in food service at some point in their lives. I was one of those people as well. My mom is Spanish, immigrated over here in, you know, the late seventies and she loved to cook. And so there was this sense of community and 
you know, coming together in a kitchen all throughout my life. And then by the time Ryan Heidinger and I coupled, it just kind of sparked a different love affair of food and hospitality and what that means for people to come together. And honestly, that's actually why Giving Kitchen exists today is because of that coming together to support someone. Giving Kitchen really starts in December of 2012 after several years of Ryan and I putting together what we called an underground supper club. We called it Prelude to Staple House. This was a dream kind of concept restaurant idea that he and I were starting here in Atlanta as an opportunity to really put our stamp on the city. And he would cook five course meals out of our home. I would serve and host and we would just get to learn about people. I mean, strangers would come into our home, sit around a dining room table. And after, you know, three, four hours, they left best friends. And we really built some incredible, incredible community here in the city around that concept of wanting to start our dream restaurant. So we did that for four years from 2009 to 2012. And by December of 2012, it was December 21st of 2012, Ryan had gotten a little bit sick and it led to having to get an MRI to diagnose what was going on. And that Friday morning of December 21st, 2012, we sat across from an oncologist and he had told us that Ryan was diagnosed with stage four gallbladder cancer. Ryan was 35 years old, never had missed a day of work otherwise in his life, was given less than 5% chance at survival, and he was given six months to live with a terminal cancer diagnosis in that moment. That was a pivotal moment in our lives. Everything became black, but it was really what happened immediately following that really changed our perspective, not only on this industry, but on humanity as a whole and of what really can happen when people come together in unity. It was a couple of days later, Ryan's bosses and mentors came to our home and sat around that table and said, let us help. Literally those three words. And we we said, okay, we're going to concentrate on, you know, Ryan's medical journey, what we need to do immediately to find our path. And our community rallied. And within three and a half weeks, a fundraiser was put on, we call it Team Heidi, get to what Team Heidi means today for Giving Kitchen, but Team Heidi being short for our last name of Heidinger, and nearly a thousand people came together, restaurants and bars from all over Atlanta, 45 of them came together to serve, you know, bites and tastings and live music and an auction and what was supposed to raise maybe $15,000 for us to be able to pay our mortgage and our utility bills that year ended up raising nearly $300,000 for us in one single magical night. And I will never forget that my late husband, he stood on the stage in front of everybody to share his gratitude, and he declared his cancer diagnosis a gift in front of everybody because of what it had done to bring people together. And Giving Kitchen was born from there. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for your loss on that front, first and foremost, but what a profound story as well. Like What a profound for something that is so terrible and so many people are, are impacted ryan had an ability to be able to turn it into something that was light and yeah yeah that's huge it's huge and i mean you you know i i don't use those words of inspired and motivated lightly for that very reason it was really remarkable to see what happens when you put that kind of substance together from somebody being willing to accept a journey and to see what uplifting can do to really support and build something. I mean, Giving Kitchen today, we're 11 and a half years old. And what Giving Kitchen as an agency has done for people in this industry, this industry that we absolutely are obsessed with and love so much, it's remarkable to see the lives that have been impacted because of someone being so selfless at the very beginning. That's incredible. Thank you for sharing that. So that announcement was made on stage. And you said, Team Heidi? Team Heidi, yep. <laughs> Heidi, which is, is is still a phenomenal fundraiser. I'm I speaking to someone about one of your fundraisers recently, actually, and they're very impressed. We'll come on to that in a sec. So yeah. how was that first step into Giving Kitchen? How was that, like, from going for owning a restaurant, you know, having what is a transformative and unexpected turn in life? How was that, okay, this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to do it? Thought yeah, process, that yeah. Back. Yeah, you're right. It's like it's these light switch kind of light bulb moments that happen in in our lives. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, wow, how does this not exist for people? You know, there are so many 
from the moment that night occurred on January 27th of 2013, and again, just hours and a couple days later for this idea of not only a nonprofit to be formed for others like Ryan, then, then this idea of, you know, working on the Prelude to Staple House and the Stream Restaurant, that became its own story. And while it may not be like the whole thing we're going to talk about today, but yes, I mean, building something, your dream with purpose and ambition became a form of medicine for Ryan and, and many, you know, during his final year. And the kind of spectacular part of that was then also this budding nonprofit. So, you know, people came together and there was all of this money. And the only thing that we concentrated on was that like other people need to be able to benefit from that gift. And so we started to hear of stories of other fellow food service workers in our town who were affected by another emergency. I mean, I remember our very first, you know, friend of Giving Kitchen was in a hit and one car accident and suffered a traumatic brain injury and had to relearn to walk and talk. And this individual was one of the first people that we gave the money that was raised for us. We gave some to her, you know, to help her through her time. So it just, it just started and that ripple just grew and grew and grew. And we, again, it was just kind of this idea of how does something not exist? So this idea of being able to pay it forward back in community was number one and to help others within the food service industry like Ryan or otherwise. I remember within a couple of months, you know, in 2013, we built a founding board and all of these people came together. And I remember going through, you know, we were building bylaws at this moment. And I just remember the question going around of like, what is Giving Kitchen going to be? Who is it going to serve? And I, even Ryan said, all I know is that I want it to be for everyone. And that meant the real fabric of food service, not just the 35-year-old white male, but it really needed to be for everyone inside this industry, from a dishwasher to an owner, from fast food to fine dining, everyone who builds and who uplifts every single community that we have in the United States. So that really was the spark and the intention and motivation so many years ago. We started as a nonprofit in hometown Atlanta, Georgia, as helping to pay financial assistance for restaurant workers when they were suffering a crisis. So whether that was a medical catastrophe, like what happened to Ryan, or another type of illness or injury, or if there was a death in the family or a housing disaster, flood or fire, that's when Giving Kitchen would step in and help pay the rent, the mortgage, the living expenses for a food service worker. And then we learned something after taking many phone calls those first couple of years that Making sure that financial aid was important because it kept a roof overhead. It kept people from not having to turn off their water. It, it prevented people from having to skip a meal in order just to pay a utility bill. But what we really heard time and time again was that there were people suffering from mental health and mental wellness opportunities. You know, thanks for paying my rent, but I'm really struggling from the fact that you know, my child has died or that I've had to move two times because of an apartment fire and just the struggles in between that it's, I'm really suffering. And that's really when we actually built our stability network program. So, which is a connection to community resources through Giving Kitchen. So at the end of the day, that's really from the here to this budding idea to then just this ripple effect and on from there. And those are the two things that we do today from a programmatic perspective is financial aid and a connection to community resources. That's incredible. I mean, Starting a nonprofit and running a nonprofit is very different to running a restaurant. How was that transition from you know staple house restaurant to running something that was was rapidly growing legs and was dining out as an experience for everyone? It's a fantastic experience, but it's entirely different from giving financial lifeline to individuals during the early days. How was that for you? Yeah, well, and I was just one of the three-legged, the tripod that people talk about at Staple House Restaurant. So Staple House Restaurant did come to fruition in September of 2015. I was one of the key leadership between my two business partners at the time. Ryan, my late husband, passed away in January of 2014. So he was able to see just the beginning parts of everything come together. And of course, you know, everything since... But Staple House did come to fruition. I was a part of that leadership team for four and a half years or so. 
and in the operational side of it. So it is very different than operating and helping run a nonprofit. At that point, we had hired our first staff at Giving Kitchen. So we've got the nonprofit and what it's doing, and it's got a board of directors. And then we also had a for-profit subsidiary at the time under Giving Kitchen, which was this restaurant, and it had a governing board as well. So there was a lot of management that had to happen. But I will say, while the two entities no longer are connected, Giving Kitchen actually sold the restaurant in 2020 to my former partners and in-laws. So that entity tie is no longer there. But what will never change is the, I think it's like that gut feeling, that soul of food service and what hospitality really means is where Giving Kitchen from a nonprofit perspective and how we pursue service of other people's is like where that comes in and where that they play together really, really well. Hospitality is, it is an exchange, but it's never just this black and white kind of opportunity. It's not just, you know, a hi, how are you and exchange information. It is a very true, deep connection and understanding thought processes of people and sharing in community and conversation and it's going that very extra step, which I do believe Giving Kitchen does exceptionally well. It's that empathy and that's, as you say, it's that deep-seated connection that it's not transactional, it, that right. you have to give a little bit of yourself in order to be able to connect with someone else, right? Yeah. And I mean, even with that, there's being in a nonprofit for 11 and a half years too, there's also on the other scale of that, there's we talk about efficiencies and what that also means in that equation of everything. So we wouldn't be in the position we are as a very successful nonprofit if we didn't have that as well. If you're enjoying this week's episode, consider heading over to our website and supporting our ongoing work in destigmatizing mental illness and creating a healthier, happier and more sustainable industry by purchasing some of our branded merchandise. We have a whole range of T-shirts, hoodies, chef's jackets, well-being journals, plus a whole host more available on worldwide dispatch all funds raised from sales of these items go towards free to access e-learning content as well as providing free support systems and help for those who may be experiencing difficulty with their mental health so i have two tangents here and i'm not sure which one to tackle with you first but let's set the scene for people so you mentioned that financial aid yeah we're a lot of people in hospitality, especially being bearing in mind some of the wages that we get paid around the world, sometimes not the best, shall we say. So financial security is sometimes hard to come by. So the financial aid is important. But what's some of the core data and under that underpins the mental health support and resources that you guys offer? And why, besides the anecdotal sort of conversations you're having people, what was the driving factor behind actually recognizing this is a severe problem that needs specific targeted interventions for? Absolutely. A, paying attention to what we were hearing. I mean, when again, we could go back to hospitality. It is truly connecting with somebody and understanding what they need. Mm. We say all the time, Giving Kitchen shows up at just the right time with the exact right of resources or financial aid to the people who need it. I mean, they there's a reciprocal kind of opportunity that's happening there. So we heard story after story, like I mentioned earlier, of I'm really struggling with X, Y, and Z. We also know that there are statistics out there that are true. This industry is the second largest industry in the United States. We, the only other one that leads is the U.S. government. So from a population density perspective, that's a large population of people in food service, 15 and a half million or so across the United States. We also know that this is an industry that does lead in suicide ideation, in substance misuse or abuse, and it is oftentimes an incredibly vulnerable population of people for the reasons you just mentioned. From my eyes and our perspective, this agency isn't about what's wrong with food service. It is so more about making someone whole and strengthening communities and what is right and good with people, not just the specific niche of people, we happen to serve that niche of people, but that's really what this is about. If there's opportunity in this work, there is a reminder of what's pivotal and every human's right of dignity 
that I think that's really what we kind of underpin, you know, from a stability network perspective for Giving Kitchen and our resources, the most common resources that we give out are going to be housing security, mental, you know, wellness and health opportunities, physical health and wellness opportunities. We actually, we partner with local clinics. And if we hear that there's a story of somebody who just hasn't gone to the doctor in a very long time or, or needs medical care in some regard and they can go to a clinic. We have partner clinics who will offer those services free for food service workers. So there's really this a true underpinning of like creating a whole opportunity for this particular industry. It's all encompassing. It's a big old task though. Like, I mean, the UK, we have, what is it? 3.2 million people that work in hospitality in the UK or it was pre-pandemic. I don't honestly know what it is now. The United States is a much, much bigger beast. So how's that been in terms of scaling? Because as a charitable organization working in an industry that has its challenges, I'm, I'm sure that the level of inquiries that you were getting through those early days was was tremendously mm-hmm. high, right? So how, you know, and although we're, we're non-profits, we're not designed to roll around in, in cash and drive Bugattis at the end of it. We're right. not doing it for that. It's, purpose, it's purpose-driven work. Right. We still need to be able to pay our overheads. So how, how did you find that during the early days? It's a really phenomenal question, actually. And I'll, you know, I go back to that directive of Ryan Heidinger's of just, I want this to be for everyone and being for everyone does not come in a day, clearly. You know, we were really, really intentional with our growth mindset in the early days, in the early years, Giving Kitchen, again, hometown nonprofit in Atlanta, only serving full service restaurant workers. So that's a, that's a small niche within this giant population of food service, right? And so, and we helped with financial aid and that was just the very beginning. And then after a few years, again, that's when we built our stability network. And I will flash forward, it took until, t- gosh, 2018, I think, before we started even serving outside of like Metro Atlanta and started serving the whole state of Georgia. So it took that many years for us just to feel confident are we going to just overwhelm if everybody, you know, knows about us in Georgia? Is this just going to overwhelm, you know, our resources? We learn very quickly, you know, that that's not necessarily the case. It takes a long time to share your story and then see this ripple effect happen. Of course, today, still here in Atlanta, still and definitely in Georgia. And as you look, if you're looking at a heat map of like who we're helping, and I'll get to that scale answer, but like we are still significantly helping kind of the southeastern region. And even as you get closer in it, all Georgia, and then of course, Atlanta, that's, that's who knows about us still. Over the last several years, and specifically when the pandemic occurred in 2020, it was a true watershed moment for Giving Kitchen. It allowed us to hone in on everything we were doing well. And everything we were not doing well, we said goodbye to. And that's when we really said, if we're going to be an agency that does really want to do the most impactful work we can within this niche kind of pipeline, we have to do two things exceptionally well. And that's exactly what we honed in on was that financial aid. Our message became more clear than ever. The resources and the amount of partnerships, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, not just here in Georgia, not just in the Southeast, but nationally. These are warm connections to resources out in, in real communities. We, you know, again, started here and what we have done from a scaling perspective is really engage communities in a way that attests to kind of our origins, you know, trust in community and and being empathy driven and just really efficient in our processes, which has taken a long time to get to. But we've built community engagement councils. So in states, so in Georgia, North Carolina and Tennessee, we're building one in Illinois. We've just hired our, our first field kind of person, a regional impact manager in Chicago, Illinois last week. So we are really building kind of these intentional communities as we cross over the country to really, of course, continue to share our mission, but, and of course, raise vital funds to help propel us forward as well. I mean, it's it's a mammoth task, especially over in the UK. Our audience that listens to this podcast are all over the globe. So for those who perhaps aren't familiar with the the way that the states are set up state by state, sometimes it's a very different culture, different yeah. laws, different, you know, there's a whole load of hoops to jump through. So the it's exactly right. Managed to do that. It's, yeah. it's incredible. And, and yeah. kudos to you and your team. That's amazing. Thank you. I mean, we're, we're still learning. I mean, from a kind of being an infant or in infancy kind of nonprofit, we're maybe not a baby, but we're still young in that perspective. I mean, from growing nationally. I think for us, you know, what was really, really important was not just to do it because that was a directive or because we wanted to. We knew we had to have the system in place. And four four or five years ago, you know, 
we would help a client. So a food service worker would come to us and they would receive assistance, whether that's financial aid or, you know, lots of resources in 45, 60 days. Today, over the last 18 months, we've been able to make that so much more efficient. And I will attest that back to, you know, meeting people at the right time with the right amount of money or resources to the exact right person. We're able to help now people within 10 to 14 business days. So when you consider, you know, having to turn a check around or, you know, payment around for your rent or your monthly utilities, it's happening right in the moment that a crisis is occurring to be able to to help prevent the, that downward spiral that could come. That's amazing. So I'm intrigued then. Come on in. Up to date. Key stats. What Given Kitchen, what sort of size are we? What are we looking at in terms of impact and team members that you have in place currently? Yeah. So um, headquarters is here in Atlanta, Georgia. Again, we have teammates who are everywhere. We've got programs, individuals, so people who help our call center who are actually on the phone with our clients in Portugal and Chicago. Again, some field managers in Chicago. A lot of people here in Atlanta. We have a multilingual call center, which means there is no barrier to entry to coming to Giving Kitchen and asking for help. Again, we will help food service workers across the United States today. We, you know, starting with one chef to now, we have helped over 21,700 individuals. There's over 5,000 children in the households of these food service individuals not to mention the the thousands of other additional household members. So when we, again, we talk about ripple effects, it's not just the 21,700. We're looking at closer to 40,000 people impacted by the work that we offer. You know, we've given away over $13.5 million in financial aid so far. That's just the very, very tip of the iceberg in the beginning because of where we are in our expansion efforts and really wanting to to carry this mission forward across the United States and really make Giving Kitchen a household name for food service. Do you look back and go, that's tremendous work? I'm I'm curious. I more think about the courageous people who are are willing to ask for help. I mean, again, we as humans, we take a lot of pride in our lives, right? And I'm again, not just this industry, myself included. You know, it, it takes a lot of effort to say, yes, please help, or I need help. It is okay to not be okay, by the way. That's really what I think about, especially, again, when I think back to like what Ryan even would think. People ask me that all the time. I don't know because he's not here today, but I know he'd probably laugh and just be, he'd be blown away. I mean, he, why? Like, why me? Like, that's such a chef cook thing to say too. Like, but it's just magnificent to see really the life-changing work that this team puts in, that our programs team and our client services team and our field manager, like everybody who's out sharing a story and just connecting with people and knowing what that does to uplift a person is kind of like, that's where I I get the pride and joy from it. Yes. Nice. And and so what's the vision moving forward then? You say we're just scratching the surface with 13 million given away in in financial aid and well, with the ripple effect, 40,000 people, what's next? Yeah. We want to put that stamp on food service individuals and families and communities that there is a resource available. Again, when we talk about those statistics of, you know, of a population of people that's often can be undervalued or unappreciated or in a vulnerable position, it doesn't have to be that way. It just doesn't. I wish there were nonprofits didn't have to exist. I wish Giving Kitchen didn't have to exist. It's, it's not the case today. And, you know, we do, I, I really see a Giving Kitchen being a household name. That's, it's kind of like the first thing that people think of when they're, when they want to help their neighbor or someone in food service. We've got lofty goals from a strategic perspective of helping 100,000 food service workers annually by 2030. It's huge. There's a lot of work that we have to do from an automation perspective and more efficiencies and and just again building and engaging within communities to hit that but we are we are working towards it so that's really what i want to see i want to see that dignity and that opportunity just entrenched in our communities wow this is the first time we've spoken but you're i can tell you're a driven individual you rest much do you get much time for yourself <laughs> your i also have a four and a half year old at home and a beautiful husband and i do rest <laughs> But yes, I happen I happen to have some really positive lots of energy. <laughs> <laughs> it's always interesting speaking to founders or co-founders of organizations, especially in our line of work, right? Where we're yeah. we're constantly talking to people about health and well-being and balance. Yeah. I say it's different. I find that doing purpose-driven work is generally different because you don't tend to 
eat into your reserves as much. But yeah, it's uh, it's kind of ironic that we're the ones putting in AFDs and split ships, right? <laughs> on a daily basis. Yeah, I think it also gives us the ability. We have the be- benefit of being surrounded by experts and, and knowledge and, and experience that perhaps those who aren't in the healthcare arena. So talk to me about Team Heidi then. You mentioned it briefly. I'm intrigued to learn more. Yes, Team Heidi has become one of our largest signature kind of tasting events and fundraising events. It's always hosted here in Atlanta, kind of that in hometown, home base. And it's it's really become just kind of that that celebration every year. It feels like a wedding every single year, if you can imagine. We have had now 12. We host it in March every year, the third Sunday evening in March. That's adjusted from you know January timeframe to a little bit later, but it's remarkable. I will say it's grown over the years. We've changed venues a few times over the years. This past Team Heidi was this past March. We had about 1,700 people. We raised $1.3 million. There's an auction. There's a hundred of, you know, Atlanta's just most beloved, you know, food partners, food and beverage partners there offering up tastings and drinks and all of the things. It's a huge party <laughs> and one that genuinely feels like just, again, a coming together, a graduation, a, a wedding. Like that's just, that's the energy that's in, in that space during Team Heidi. And it's, it's just become something that we, we look forward to every year. That's incredible. You say 1,700 people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can't imagine and it's that. interesting. It still feels intimate. <laughs> it's wild. It's wild. It's a testament to just, again, what's been built inside community. I mean, it's just, it's really remarkable. Well, fair play, fair play. And then from a more personal note, I mean, obviously, you, you know, you've had a change of direction with life events, but have there been any profound learnings or experiences, aside from the obvious, that mm-hmm. you've had since starting Given Kitchen that you've been like... Had I known this 15 years ago, my life would have been yeah. different. I mean, honestly, when people turn to me and they do that question of, yeah, that or like, what would you tell yourself? It's a really trust in your resources because I've, I've seen what it does actively, tangibly to just really trust the people around you. And I think it's all a part of this, you know, opportunity of not being afraid to say that you're not OK or that it is OK to ask for help. I have just I've seen it not only for myself, but for 21,700 other people just in the last 11 years, what that means. There was something that Ryan said before he died uh, in 2013. He gave a, a speech and to quote him, he said, anything long lasting or worthwhile takes time and complete surrender. And that is clearly ingrained in my head. We have it on our wall here in the office in, with a really beautiful mural. But to just, again, just to, to really surrender and put yourself selflessly kind of down to really see the pursuit of something so exceptional is, I mean, life's work right there. So, What a profound way, I think, to end this podcast on. I mean, it's it truly is inspiring. And I, I mean that from both a professional and a personal perspective level to be able to take something that was was tragic and to turn it into something that has just impacted a few people you know impacted thousands and is genuinely supporting an industry that needs all the support it can get i think it's just it's yeah yeah, it's tremendous and and it's fantastic and thank you for for that work as well and were there any sort of points or anything that you feel that our audience should be aware of with Giving Kitchen before we sort of wrap this up. Thank you. I just, I genuinely really appreciate the time and the space to share. It's these opportunities that really will, will help me see the vision that I have for Giving Kitchen. You know, I think, again, I just think for anybody who's working in food service that we're here in the United States today, you never know, I guess, where that will take us. But we, we are available. We're at Giving Kitchen on all social. We share a lot of stories that food service workers allow us to share. These are their stories. And I just think it's a really great opportunity to see really the, the true impact of, of what we're doing for this industry. So at Giving Kitchen on social, givingkitchen.org online, you can ask for help. And of course, if you're somebody out there in community who wants to donate, there are plenty of ways to give on our website as well. Amazing. And from a burnt chef level, I think we'll just have a chat afterwards about how we can support in terms of that saturation point, in terms of, you know, the multilingual therapeutic elements as well that we've we've now got in place and, and much, much more. So, yeah, looking forward to hopefully 
supporting your thank you your ambitious but perfectly realistic goals i think i think it'll be great to be part of that mission thank you would love it jen thanks ever so much my sincere pleasure <laughs>